let's recap what we had studied last time. I discussed various modes of transmission, various species of plasmodium, vector, and life cycle of plasmodium. Today, we are going to start with pathogenesis of plasmodium. If you remember the uh, asexual life cycle in humans, there was an erythrocytic phase where the red blood cells are destroyed by the release of merozoids and also by the action of spleen. So spleen would first sequester the infected RBCs and then to lyse them. So these splenic uh, macrophages have a central role in phagocytosing and infected uh, uh, RBCs are killed and there is release of certain pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, for instance, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 1, interferon gamma. So this is the main pathogenesis. Now I would like to talk about Plasmodium falciparum pathogenesis in particular because it produces a life-threatening infection. Uh, the one reason is uh, due to its complications, which we'll discuss later on. The other reason is that it can invade all ages of RBCs with a very high level of parasitemia, which is about 5%. If you talk about the other species of plasmodium, for instance, plasmodium malaria, it can just affect mature red blood cells or plasmodium vivex, which can just uh, infect the reticular sites. And they can produce a low level of parasitemia, which would seldomly exceed 2%. Okay, now coming back to the um, pathogenesis. Now, the first step is surface changes in RBCs. So, the parasitized RBCs cause them to express surface proteins. And the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which I just mentioned, they increase adhesion molecules for these surface proteins. Okay, the next step is these infected RBCs, they adhere to the adhesion molecules on the endothelial cells and the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. Uh, and it essentially involves the microcirculation, right? So the infected RBCs, once uh, they are going to adhere to the adhesion molecule on the endothelial cells, now this would trigger coagulation by activating thrombin and would form a clot. And I would say it would form rosettes. The RBCs, they would coagulate with one another forming a clot and this results in obstruction of microcirculation to various organs with dysfunction of various organs. For example, brain, um, it can be kidneys, etc. So apart from this, there can be disruption of endothelial barrier integrity and there can also be leukocytic infiltration. So I'm summarizing this pathogenesis of plasmodium falciparum again. So there are surface changes in RBCs. This cause the infected RBCs to attach to the endothelial lining of the blood vessels um, and they try to stick themselves and this forms a clot and this can obstruct microcirculation to the multiple organs with damage to multiple organs. What are the characteristic features of different uh, plasmodium species? Now, if you see the incubation period, it is uh, 10 to 17 days in case of Vivex and Avelli and the malaria has the longest incubation period if you compare with the rest of the species. Now, the periodicity is very important. 48 hours periodicity is for Vivex Avelli and also uh, it's almost similar for Falciparum. And the fever is going to return on the third day, which makes it tertian. So benign tertian for both Vivex and Avelli and uh, it is malignant tertian for falci uh, falciparum and you sh uh, should remember this uh, from life-threatening infection. So uh, this is malignant tertian fever. If the fever returns after 72 hours, which means on the fourth day, it becomes a quartan fever. And you should remember that the plasmodium falciparum has strong predilection uh, for cerebral malaria as a complication. And 
in case of plasmodium malariae, the nephrotic syndrome can occur as a complication. And I hope you know what is um, nephrotic syndrome. It's a kidney disorder that causes your body to pass too much protein in urine. So it is usually caused by damage to the glomeruli and it's an immune complex mediated disease which can also cause acute renal failure. What are the signs and symptoms of malaria, which is a disease? So there are three stages. The first one is the cold stage in which the patient would experience uh, rigors or chills. So rigors is um, shivering along with feeling of cold. And apart from this, some patients may have vomiting, cough or diarrhea. And this stage may last from 20 minutes to one hour. Then is the hot stage in which patient would experience fever and this may uh, last from one to four hours. And final stage is the sweating stage and um, there is profuse sweat, uh, sweating in this last stage and this may last uh, from two to three hours. Patient may also be brought unconscious in case of cerebral malaria and you should also remember uh, keep this thing in your mind that Modified signs or symptoms can be there with patients on antimalarials, which are used for treatment of malaria. Let's talk about complications of malaria. And again, I would talk with special reference to plasmodium falciparum complications first. So it can cause black water fever, number one, number two, cerebral malaria, number three, algid malaria. In case of black water fever, the precipitating factors can be heavy parasitic infection. For example, heavy infection from plasmodium falciparum, use of quinine as a treatment for malaria and glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So these patients don't have this enzyme which helps the red blood cells to function normally. And these patients can have hemolytic anemia. The main pathogenesis in black water fever is intravascular hemolysis and uh, it has been thought that some hemolytic agent is involved where the RBCs undergo lysis and release large quantity of oxyhemoglobin into the bloodstream. In case of plasmodium falciparum, sorry, um, the intravascular hemolysis um, occurs periodically at the time of schizogony and this probably would stimulate the reticular endothelial system to form antibodies against these two antigens, hemolysin and lecithin. So there would be repeated um, uh, exposure with hypersensitization, and this would end up into the uh, intravascular hemolysis. So there are three effects of intravascular hemolysis. Number one is metheme albuminemia. Now I want you to think of something is coming inside blood if it is anemia and if something is coming inside urine, it is urea. So in case of metheme albuminemia, what happens is that this oxyhemoglobin in blood is broken down into globin and hematin part. Now, initially, this hematin part is in ferrous state, which gets converted into ferric state. And then this combines with serum albumin, and then it forms metheme albumin. Now, this is not excreted in urine because the glomeruli cannot filter this metheme uh, albumin, and therefore, it is retained in plasma, causing metheme albuminemia. Okay, now let's talk about hyperbilirubinemia. The bilirubin, which is formed by the reticular endothelial system, is far in excess of what the liver can excrete or handle. And again, it is retained in plasma, causing hyperbilirubinemia. Okay, the hemoglobin urea, how it occurs, and Excess of hemoglobin remains in the circulating blood and when the heptoglobin, which is a protein of plasma, is unable to bind the free hemoglobin, it is excreted through kidneys causing hemoglobin urea. So the oxyhemoglobin, which is reddish in color, gets converted into methemoglobin, black in color. 
um, um, in, and this actually happens in the renal tubules or this is deposited in the tubules as acid hematin. The color of urine, which is uh, dark brown, this is because of this met hemoglobin in case of black water fever. So the clinical features are fever, rigors, followed by loin pain. This area refers to the side of uh, human body below the rib cage to just above the pelvis. And I've just explained why there would be dark brown urine. So the direct and indirect bilirubin would rise. So there could be vomiting, uh, there could be liver failure, and even acute renal failure. So the serum urea and creatinine can rise uh, in this condition. Then the second complication can be algid malaria and this is because of adrenal glands damage. So there is peripheral circulatory failure and it may be a presenting feature in some cases of malaria with a systolic blood pressure less than 80 millimeters of mercury in supine position with a cold clammy skin uh, which may be cyanotic and with rapid feeble pulse. Hypervolemia due to reduced fluid intake, high grade fever, sweating, vomiting and diarrhea may also contribute to reduced pressures and then is the gram negative septicemia. So it has been blamed as an important cause of hypertension in some cases of falciparum infection. So gram negative bacteria um, uh, which is present and multiplying in the bloodstream. So this is called as gram negative septicemia. We'll talk about this gram negative septicemia in quite detail when we'll talk about general bacteriology. Cerebral malaria. Please remember the pathogenesis is the same surface changes of RBCs. Uh, the RBCs, they stick to one another on the endothelial lining of the blood vessel wall. There is formation of a clot with uh, obstruction of microcirculation and dysfunction of multiple organs. So there is uh, inadequate tissue perfusion uh, in the brain vessels and this results in headache, drowsiness, confusion, coma and cerebral ataxia. Then is the hyperparaxia. So because of the certain cytokines like interleukins and tumor necrosis factor, which are responsible for normally producing rigors and chills. So at times the fever may rise up to 106 degrees Fahrenheit or even more than 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And you should always remember that the anemia in case of malaria is of hemolytic type. Um, and uh, the size of the RBCs are normal and the hemoglobin is less. So they are hyperchromic, normocytic. This brings us to a very interesting part um, of this lecture and this is biological resistance against malaria. So number one is the hemoglobin S gene which is the sickle cell gene. Now the affected RBCs they sickle more quickly due to lower pH and the parasite is phagocytosed and destroyed. Now, in case of homozygous state, this phagocytic action is quite inadequate. Similarly, the uh, beta thalassemia trait, the affected RBCs uh, membrane show increased sensitivity to peroxidase enzyme damage and therefore the parasite cannot uh, uh, adapt itself. Similarly, there is another condition, velocytosis. So there is a morphological abnormality of these RBCs and they assume oval shape. So these rigid RBCs have reduced expression of many erythrocytic antigens. So basically changes in the surface antigenic composition uh, would not uh, help them adapt to the uh, RBCs and produce further infection. The G6PD deficiency, which is sex linked, um, involves the heterozygous have double population of normal and deficient RBCs. So the G6PD deficient people would probably invite more parasites than normal. And this is called as genetic mosaicism. This actually interferes with the adaptation of parasites. So genetic mosaics 
are two or more population of cells with different genotypes in one individual. Okay, the Duffy negative homozygous recessive state. Now, again, these people are resistant against malaria. So, I hope you know there is a Duffy blood group antigen. And those people who are Duffy negative, the glycophorin receptors are missing as these receptors are required for plasmodium vivax to attach and invade RBCs. So, these are the conditions in which the, uh, the people or the patients would be um, resistant against malaria. Now let's talk about laboratory diagnosis of malaria. First is the microscopic examination and I want you to first write down thick and thin blood films when this question comes because it is the gold standard. For thick and thin blood films, you just take a drop of blood. As you can see over here, this is a thick film. So it is um, spread in the form of a circle. And if we talk about the thin film, you use a spreader slide at a specific angle and you push it forward rapidly and smoothly to make a thin film. And then these films are uh, stained with the gems are staining and you examine this under microscope. So the thick film is 11 times more sensitive than thin blood film for picking up low level of infection. Therefore, it estimates the parasitemia. But one downside is that it is not good for differentiating species as the parasites are distorted. The thin film um, involves um, parasites with appearance best preserved and it is used for species identification. Now this is structure of a malarial parasite and this is actually the trophozoid stage. So this is the bluish cytoplasm which is towards the periphery and this is the vacuole inside and there is one chromatin dot. So at times there can be more than one chromatin dots, for example, in case of plasmodium falciparum. Okay, so we are still continuing with the microscopic examination. Now, once you will examine these slides under microscope, you can observe different asexual forms under microscope. So in case of plasmodium vivax, you can see that there is trophozoid stage, which is the immature and then is the mature ring form. Now, the cytoplasm opposite to nucleus is thicker and if you talk about the mature form, it has more amoeboid shape. The schizont is completely going to fill the enlarged RBC with 12 to 24 merozoids and the gametocytes are spherical in shape. The infected RBCs uh, are enlarged and there are certain dots. The Schaffner's dot is present in Plasmodium vivax. These dots are actually antigens of Plasmodium uh, in RBCs which can give color on staining. Okay, talking about Plasmodium falciparum. So the trophozoid stage or the ring form stage, for, uh, at times it can, uh, I mean this malarial parasite can move towards the periphery and these are called as marginal forms or recall forms. And there may be more than one ring in one cell. Sometimes with two chromatin dots, as you can see over here, here in case of plasmodium vivax, there is only one chromatin dot. And here you can find two chromatin dots or more than one uh, ring forms. In case of um, this um, mature trophozoid, you will find that this is more compact in shape. The schizont is going to fill almost uh, two-thirds of RBC with 28 to 24 merozoids and the gametocyte is very important. It is going to have banana shaped or it is uh, crescent shaped or half moon shaped appearance and it is quite different from rest of the species uh, gametocytes. For example, you can see plasmodium vivax, malaria, valley. So they are more or less 
राउंड और ओवल इन शेप प्लाज्मोडियम मलेरी एंड प्लाज्मोडियम वैली ट्रोफोजोइड्स दे हैव मोर स्क्वेरिश अपीयरेंस एंड द द मैच्योर ट्रोफोजोइड is more in the form of band in case of plasmodium malariae and if you talk about a valley it is more comet shape or amoeboid shape uh, i would say slightly amoeboid shape the schizoid is almost going to fill the normal sized rbc and it is going to have 6 to 12 merozoids for both malaria and a valley uh, whereas the schizoid of plasmodium valley um would fill 3 quarters of rbc the gametocytes are round to oval in shape for both uh, plasmodium malariae and plasmodium ovale the rbcs are not enlarged in case of malaria but in case of ovale the rbcs are slightly enlarged okay so these are the morphological differences between different plasmodium species you should also remember that in case of plasmodium vivax plasmodium malari and plasmodium ovale the trophozoite the schizoid and the gametocyte all of these stages can come inside blood whereas in case of plasmodium falciparum you would just find the ring or the trophozoid stage and the gametocyte stage only so this is a very important point okay then is another technique which is called as quantitative buffy coat it's a new technique and it uses fluorescent microscope the whole procedure takes place in a glass hematocrit tube which is pre coated internally with acridin orange stain and potassium oxalate so it is filled with 55 to 65 microliters of blood and this tube is then centrifuged and the components separate according to their densities forming bands so you need to have a fluorescent microscope for this purpose blood counts they are not of diagnostic value and they may just give you some clue for example the wbc count can be less or it can even be normal in case of acute malaria or it can be moderately low in case of chronic malaria or they can be also monocytosis uh, monocytosis along with it okay immunological techniques these are antibody based and antigen based now in case of antibody based there are two tests immunofluorescent test and enzyme linked immunosorbinase test we'll talk in quite detail about the principle and procedures of these particular tests when we'll uh, come to the virology and immunology section for now just remember that in case of immunofluorescent test a fluorescent dye is used in this test and it conjugates with the gamma globulin of the serum if this conjugated gamma globulin contains malarial antibody it will adhere to the relevant multiple malarial parasites and they would be recognized as glistening particles under fluorescent microscope in case of elisa this method uses a soluble malarial antigen which is coated on the walls of microtiter plate so this is a microtiter plate and if this test is positive the antibody binds with the antigen and there is a visible color change there is antigen based test and this is the rapid diagnostic test this would give you result in about 15 to 20 minutes all you need to have is a kit so it is sensitive where um um i mean it is got a good sensitivity if a uh, microscopic examination is not possible so the antibodies are detected against the histidine rich protein 2 this is an antigen only for plasmodium falciparum so here you can see that this is the line for histidine rich protein 2 and this is actually the plasmodium falciparum and then is another antigen which is lactate dehydrogenase antigen now this ldh antigen is present in all plasmodium species so pan means uh, this is for all plasmodium species and this is the ldh line and this is the control line so initially these bands were 
uh, or these lines were colorless and once you added the serum uh, if the emulatal infection is there so it would change color from colorless to pink colored pants so control should always be positive and then you you can see the pan line is also positive and the plasmodium falciparum line is also positive then there can be certain other molecular techniques like pcr so the important thing to remember is the more than one ring forms or two chromatin dots in case of plasmodium falciparum with crescent shaped chemotocytes and thick and thin smears they remain the gold standard so the source of this lecture is warren levinson and chatterjee you are welcome to ask any queries if you have and you can contact me thank you